Thank you very much for inviting me to speak to you this morning. And I was very pleased to have the opportunity just to listen to part of the first, your first session of the day. Uh, and, and hopefully what I'm about to say will fit in with the conversation that you started last night and you will continue uh, throughout the week. Now, this is a very exciting. Um, the, this particular African Science Leadership Program is something we've discussed for a long time. Uh, I recall many discussions in my office with Bernard and Lorenzo in particular. And it's, it's wonderful to see Eva back here as well and to see all of you. And I said to Eva when I greeted her, it's finally happening. And uh, we look forward to the feedback that will come from this very first uh, program. And I'm sure that you're going to give us insights and further information on, on, on how we can uh, improve on areas that might you feel are limited in this initial session uh, program. And, and so, and take it forward. I'm going to talk to you more broadly about some of the issues that, that is on my mind as a leader of a higher education institution, and particularly a public university like the University of Pretoria, where we have a growing enrollment every year of undergraduate students. Uh, this year, we're going to probably just uh, step over the 50,000 mark when it comes to full-time uh, contact students. And one of the, the issues that I think about is, or the big questions is always, are we preparing our young people for the future? And how do we know that we're doing so? And in thinking through this question, I rely quite a lot on, on what other people are thinking and writing about the future. And one of the books that I think is most talked about, or, it, or has been most talked about in the 2015 year, is a book titled Exponential Organizations. How many people here have read it, uh, or know about it? Well, you, you don't really have to read it, and I'll, I'll tell you why, because many books say much the same thing. But this book called Exponential Organizations is talked a lot in business management circles. In fact, one of our professors, our head of business management, re recently gave her inaugural lecture in the university. And there I saw her referring to this book called Exponential Organizations. Suffice it for me to say now, it's co-authored by three luminaries of the business world. And the central idea in this book is change is occurring at a rate much faster than ever before in the history of human time. And they provide all sorts of evidence. Looking at organizations, and particularly businesses started in the last two decades, and how quickly they're changing compared to businesses that were started 50 or even 30 years ago. And they also point out, not only is change happening at a faster rate than ever before in the history of humanity, but it's also coming at us from multiple different directions. Now, why I'm not giving you all the details of the book is because there are many pieces of writings and books that are published or have been published in the recent past that are basically offering us the same message. If, for example, I refer to what's coming out of the McKinsey Global Institute. Now, McKinsey is one of those think tank organizations that people often quote, particularly if you go to events like the World Economic Forum that's happened in Cape Town, Many people will be using these think tanks as sources of information. Now, the most recent publication from the McKinsey Global Institute, in fact, was published in April this year, has virtually the same message as that first book I referred to, Exponential Organizations. This time, the title is No Ordinary Disruption. And once again, the central argument uh, and here they refer to and make a comparison with the, the changes that happened around the Industrial Revolution. If we think back to the Industrial Re Revolution, what happened then is that human li living changed in all its dimensions, but it was mostly due to one or two major technological shifts or innovations. But what's happening now 
is we have many so-called disruptions coming at us from different directions. They refer to four of these. And I'll, I'll use what, what they, the four that they refer to. So firstly, they talk about the changing locus of economic activity across the globe. The shift from uh, mark, or the shift in markets to the kind of from the old world or the global north into emerging markets, and particularly they refer to trade flows between China and Africa. But in relation to this shift in in locus of economic activity, we have to think about urbanisation and the changing nature of cities. I should mention that. I think like many of the countries from in which you were born, the cities in emerging markets, and particularly African cities, are fundamentally different to cities in Europe or in North America. And one of the ways is the diversity of our cities. That the more town planners or city or policy makers try to deal with the informal part, the more difficulty they have. And it requires a mind shift in thinking about in what's considered or categorized as informal parts of the city and formal parts of the city actually make one holistic picture. But that's the first factor, urbanization and the shift uh, in the locus of economic activity. The second one is, of course, the acceleration in the scope, scale and the economic <coughs> impact of technology. Now, later this week, I think it's on Wednesday this week, at the University of Pretoria, we're hosting one of the world's experts on big data, or be, uh, what is called big data science. Yeah. So what are we talking about here? We're not talking about uh, massive changes in processing power alone or connectivity, but we're also talking about an entire data revolution. And what this does is place unprecedented volumes of information in front of us and every one of us. So in a university, if you're an academic, you have to think about your teaching in a fundamentally different way. When I was an undergraduate student, the lecturer had the information and we sat there with textbooks. Uh, well now, you don't need to sit there with a textbook. Most students, and in fact we in our university, 97% of all the undergraduate students will sit there with a small device, usually a smartphone, and they can access the world of information in the same way that the lecturer has access to. So then we must fundamentally think about what teaching is and what learning is. Um, and in this environment, we have started talking about notions of flipped classrooms and a whole new way of, of teaching and a new way of learning. It also means, for example, that we have to think about power in a different way. When the lecturer in the 1980s, I was an undergraduate of the 1980s, stood in front of me, they were all powerful. They had knowledge. I didn't have access to that same information. But now the power dynamic in the classroom is fundamentally different. So we have to think about power in new ways. So let me say, this is not what the McKinsey report says. I'm going back to the four, the, the four trends that they talk about, but each time what I'm trying to do is translate it into my world. So in my world, when people talk about a revolution in technology, I have to think about what does this mean for teaching and learning in the university. And for me, it shifts the power dynamic, dynamic between lecturer and student. The third big shift or trend they talk about is changing demographics. Now for most of the global north, in Europe, in Japan, in North America, they're talking about aging populations and the cost of aging populations. When it comes to Africa, we're talking about youth bulges and a youth demographic. Now this is interesting. So. The trend that McKinsey writes about is an aging world. When I interpreted it, 
reinterpret that into my world. My world is not about an aging de <coughs> demographic. It's about what kind of future do we face when we know in South Africa, for example, there are about 2.7 million individuals between the ages of 18 to 24 who are unemployed, who are not in education. Now, 2.7 million young people today are 2.7 million people in their 30s in 10 years' time. Now, the world looks fundamentally different if you're unemployed in your 30s compared to when you're unemployed at 18 or 19 years old. What consequences does that have for us uh, in all dimensions in terms of provision of, uh, of services for which we expect people to pay these days? So demographics, I would say, um, and that's a reinterpretation of what McKinsey is saying as the third major trend. And the final one is mobility. Never before in the history of humanity have we seen mobility the way we see it now. M the mobility of people, mobility of ideas, mobility of technology. Now, for me, that's something I think about leading the University of Pretoria. Why? Firstly, the days when we sat around complaining about how the Europeans were stealing the best brands of our, our region or our country takes us nowhere. My thinking has to be, what do I do knowing that people are going to move around, that talent is going to move around the world, that ideas will move around the world? How do I engage with that in, in, in a positive sense? Particularly when we think about knowledge, and all of you being scientists, what do we do about this? On the one hand, we have an open access movement. On the other hand, we would like to protect and keep in Africa the knowledge that we generate and the talent that we generate in Africa. One of the dilemmas that we need to navigate. When it comes to higher education and scholarship itself, there is an equal number of publications like the one, exponential organizations uh, that I referred to from the business world, or no ordinary disruption from think tanks like McKinsey. In a higher education, there, there are a number of other publications. The one that many people or many higher education leaders talked about quite a lot about uh, over the last year, something called an avalanche is coming. And the author of this warns all university leaders across the world that the future of universities will be fundamentally different to the present. And they say, will we need bricks and mortar in the future? They talked about MOOCs, massive online courses, and how that may change access and success um, in the future. But let me come specifically to the world of scholarship the world of science and the world of research. For me, one of the most influential reports was in 2010, long before these other books that I've talked about. And this was a report from the World uh, Social Sciences Organization. And in this report, from the perspective of scholars in social science, it talked about a confluence of crises and how we need to rethink our scholarship and the way in which we conduct research because of a confluence of crisis. And the essential message in this particular report is that the world is more coupled or connected than ever before. So what might happen on the southern tip of Africa? What might happen in Japan? Or what might happen in the US has an impact on the other end of the world. There's no way it doesn't impact us in one way or another. And they secondly argued that in addition to being more tightly coupled as a global community, the issues we face have become more, far more complex and cannot be tackled by any one set of disciplines or any particular small grouping of knowledge fields. 
issues like biodiversity loss, which for a long time have been addressed by only those who were trained with Bachelor of Science degrees and were hardly ever tackled by those who might have Bachelor of Arts degrees or Bachelor of Social Science degrees. Water resource management. For, for those of us who live in South Africa, management of energy resources, that all of these big issues require us to think fundamentally differently from a new perspective. And in the policy making world, and you might have uh, encountered these terms before, certainly in, in Bernard and Lorenzo's writing, they refer to wicked and tame problems with the wicked problems being these very complex ones. And I'm going to give you an example that I thought of. And I plan to go to my, my, some of my colleagues to talk about this. The one thing that I've been thinking about is rhino poaching. I'm sure all of you are familiar with rhino poaching. Now rhino poaching, we've invested many, I think millions, of South African rands in trying to prevent rhino poaching. And about a decade later, we actually haven't solved the problem. Um, celebrities are fundraising, and most recently, about three weeks ago, I saw in the media, now what we're doing is trying to send rhinos to the US so that the, um, the heritage can be reserved. And I thought this is even more ridiculous that we're now sending our animals elsewhere because we can't solve the rhino poaching problem. And then I thought to myself, you know, when, I, when we talk about rhino poaching, the people who they often refer to as the experts in stopping rhino poaching are the scientists in our faculty of veterinary science. And more recently it occurred to me how ridiculous this is. Because what do the people know in veterinary science? Well, they know about prevention of illness, about animal health problems. If we look at round nail poetry, it's not about that. It's about flows of capital, illicit flows of capital. It's about culture. It's about traditional th uh, belief systems. It's a whole complex uh, uh, set of factors. And yet, we think the vets are going to solve the problem. Now, Lorenzo and Bernard, I haven't gone there yet to, to tell him, I think, you know, actually to solve this problem, you need to speak to people at the other parts of the university. Uh, because we must realize that we're not making progress. It's actually just getting worse. For me, that's an example of a wicked problem. That we have, we have really top people in the veterinary science faculty. They're at the top of their particular a knowledge gap, but they really can't solve this problem because the expertise doesn't rest with them alone. They actually have to bring in people who are economists, people who understand uh, uh, perhaps more, more indigenous culture, belief systems, oral traditions that have been passed from one generation to another, and so forth. Issues of poverty <coughs> alleviation, crime syndicates, uh, the list can perhaps go on. And this is why I think we have to talk about and start thinking about what some people call transdisciplinary uh, work, or others call convergent science. But how do we do this? What I'm saying to you has been recognized globally. So the International Council for Science and the International Social Science Council about a decade ago got together and started talking about new ways of tackling old problems. And out of that came a big movement, and you can click it on, called Future Earth. Mm. Now, Future Earth was about bringing together the environmental science movement with a whole range of other science groupings to tackle the whole question of global sustainability, and particularly to map that onto the, uh, the Sustainable Development Goals, which are now replacing the Millennium Development Goals. Um, and we expect that to happen formally later this year. 
But even if I look at future Earth, I think that there's going to be a problem there. And part of the problem is that if we look at who is leading future Earth, it's very difficult to find Africa listed amongst the leadership. And unless we do so, we're simply going to repeat some of the, 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 the old patterns. So one of the, the opportunities we have, and particularly the opportunities you have, is where are you going to put your voice or insert your voice in, in these global movements like Future Earth, but are mostly led by the global north. So this movement, to my mind, in thinking about these complex issues, bring to us immeasurable opportunities. But at the same time, I think the challenges can be deeply unsettling for us. And why are they unsettling? Because it's very difficult for us as humanity, each one of us, we tend fundamentally as human beings to rely on what we know. And unconsciously and consciously, we, we constantly go back to what we know. And leadership is a nice example of how we tend to do this on an everyday basis. So let me say something about leadership. I'm sure that, well, let me talk about an opportunity I had to speak about issues facing us um, on the continent <coughs> with a number of world-renowned speakers. And one of them is known to all of you, Mo Ibrahim, who is Africa's well-known, one of Africa's most well-known leaders, wealthy individual. As a philanthropist, he's putting his money into quite a few <coughs> philanthropic causes. And when I listened to him, he said two things. Now, the first thing will probably not surprise us, or neither of them will surprise us, but the first thing he said, it's about time we as Africans take responsibility for solving our own problems. We, we, we cannot look north or outside of ourselves. We have to take full responsibility. The second one he talked about is the importance of leadership. Now this is a statement I hear very often. Certainly in current day South Africa, uh, with all sorts of terms like Nkandla and Marikana and so forth, everybody says we need good leadership and leadership will solve the problem. Well, this is one of those statements that I think we must be critical of because we all say it all the time, but what do we actually mean? <clears throat> Most of us continue to think about leadership as a set of characteristics that belong to an individual person. And I'm sure that you've started thinking about your own leadership, and you, you think about that as an ongoing basis. So we think about leaders, and generally speaking, you do any survey, people say, leaders are people who need to take decisions. And in a world of greater complexity, they need to take tough, hard decisions. They can't please everybody all the time. We also say we want leaders who have a vision of the future. We also say leaders have to be confident people. They have to be able to express that vision. They need courage. They need to be bold. And they need to give us a sense that they can influence people. We look for characteristics that we call charisma, for example. Now, about 50, up to about 50 years ago, most people argued that great leaders are born and not made. Um, and we know a number of the great leaders of, of Africa. Most of us are familiar with the names, even if we haven't read the, the, the work uh, firsthand. But in about the late 1970s, that idea that people had to be born great leaders changed. And more and more research has been done, and the current thinking is that all of us have potential to be great leaders. And that's why you can. Uh, so I too have gone on programs like this in order to develop my potential for leadership. Along with this thinking is that leadership can take diverse forms. 
we don't all have to express our leadership capability in exactly the same way. Particularly if we think about gender, uh, if we think about cultural differences, good leadership can be expressed in a variety of different ways. But still we struggle with this question, and, and I'm sure last night, well I heard last night you talked about responsible leadership, but what, what does it actually mean? And over the years, if we go into any bookshop, you'll see that nowadays one of the most popular terms is transformational leadership. How do we become transformative leaders? And certainly in Africa, and particularly in South Africa, we talk about the need for transformative leadership. Changing someone who has a, a, a different way of looking at things uh, will bring a different paradigm. But yet, has humanity we still hope for a hero in some way or another. If you think we criticize our presidents, we say what we need is a change of presidents, that will solve the problem, who's a real or a better leader. We hope that someone, somewhere, will come along and give us the answers to these complex questions and give us the solutions but it's unrealistic. And it's particularly unrealistic given the complexity of the problems we face. Yes, leadership is required. Yes, we do need to look at our individual characteristics. What do we bring to leadership? But very importantly, we must recognize that leadership has to be diffuse across our society. We need leadership at every level. We need leadership in the science domain. We need leadership in the private sector. We need leadership, yes, in the president's office. But we also have to take responsibility for our own leadership. But very importantly, we have to think about leadership and the characteristics of individuals in relation to one another. And I want to emphasize the in relation to one another. Because somebody who might be a great leader in North America, in the US, if we bring that same person here, will they be a great leader? Not necessarily. Because great leaders at the individual level, and particularly great leadership for the 21st century, will come out of our ability to relate to, to the globe, at the global level, but very particularly at the local level. And I want to leave you with three thoughts about science, science leadership in particular. The first is that when you pursue a career in science, you are inherently pursuing a path of leadership. And you're inherently pursuing a path of transformative leadership doesn't matter what your domain of science, because science has always been about leadership and transformation. It's just seldom that we put it all together in those words. Let's think about what science really is. Well, it's about discovery and innovation. Leadership has to be about discovery and innovation. That's what we look for in leadership, bringing new ways of thinking, bringing a vision of the future. That's what science is fundamentally. We constantly use words like cutting edge, pioneering. In South Africa, our scientists aspire to be deemed leading by their peers. Our National Research Foundation has a rating system to encourage that way of thinking. No matter what your field of science is, when you start out as a master student, if you supervise somebody, like most of us do, you're not expected mostly to come up with something brand new. But when you start doing a PhD, that's the thing you have to do in order to get a doctoral degree, to fill a space, to, to fill a space in the knowledge domain that nobody else has filled. That's, that takes leadership. In modern language, people talk about thought leadership, <coughs> but that's essentially what it's about. You also have to be transformative. 
So in other words, when the person goes back to the same question, you're going to have made a contribution that transforms what we know and do not know about the particular question or problem that you're tackling. So in and of itself, to my mind, science is leadership. It's a particular type of leadership. And, we, and for many scientists, perhaps we haven't thought about it in this particular way. The second one, or the second thought about science and leadership, is that I think, unlike in the past, in today's world, scientists who are inherently leaders in the knowledge space must also take engagement seriously. It's not sufficient to engage only with your peers through scholarly publications. Yes, those are important. But it's important and particularly important for us as African leaders and as African scientists to think about engagement with our local communities, engagement with people who make policy, engagement with people in leadership across the board. Otherwise, these wonderful ideas that we come up with will simply not have the impact that we would like it to have. Or we will lose control of the impact, even though we don't actually have control. So let me give you an example. Many of us have opportunities to go to forums on food security, public debates. And one of the public debates is nowadays about healthy food. Our Minister of Health in South Africa, for example, is talking about too much salt, um, too much sugar, uh, making public policy around advertising for fast food companies and so forth. And in those discussions, invariably, somebody raises a question of genetically modified foods. And I'm struck about how little the public knows about this space. But what has become a growing rally point is that people think that this is something we must oppose. Now, the question I ask myself is, if we, or all of us, as scientists, as scholars, took our public engagement responsibility seriously, wouldn't there be a different kind of public debate? Engagement also means thinking about how our contribution resonates or disrupts our traditional ways of thinking. And it does disrupt our traditional ways of thinking. So when you start a path of scientific leadership, you're constantly disrupting through your work, your traditional ways of thinking. The ideas you've grown up with, you are challenging that. How do you deal with that at an individual level? That you're now doing something, you're pursuing an idea, you're finding answers to questions that perhaps not don't sit very easy with the community in which you grew up in. I think engagement is part of that responsibility. That we see our contribution in a very holistic way in relation to culture, tradition, and particularly indigenous knowledge systems. And that brings me to the third and final thought that I think is important for this set of conversation about scientific leadership. is how do you see yourself in relation to your community at the local level, at the national level, at the continental, regional level, and at the global level? And if we go back in the history of science, and we don't have to go back here very far in South Africa, to recognize that scientific innovation and technology innovation can be used for multiple purposes, moral good and moral evil, can be used to promote social justice or to deny people social justice. So self in relation to community is also about thinking about your moral purpose in, in, in whatever scientific domain you pursue. And this is our responsibility as scholars and scientists. It's about how to connect 
our role as leaders in the knowledge world of the 21st century with a whole range of moral issues, ethical issues. And that's where engagement is so fundamental to, to what we do. It's particularly fundamental for scientific institutions, science councils, institutes, and universities like the University I lead. What is our set of values that we pursue as a public university? Now, one of the ways it comes together is about the choices we make. So for the University of Pretoria, we say, if you look at all our documents, we are a research-intensive university. Now, most research-intensive universities want to pursue world rankings. It's kind of a, there's a prestige value. It's about your level of competitiveness. And yes, we do pursue world rankings. But it's also, for me, realizing and sending out the message that our aspiration is not to be in the top 200 in the world. Because as a public university, in a country with a youth demographic like we have, our first and foremost responsibility is to make education accessible for the talented people in larger and larger numbers every year. Now that goes against, the, against rankings, because rankings measure things like staff-student ratios. We are growing every year at the university. I started out by telling you about numbers. Over the next by 2025, we're going to be 60,000 students. In order for us to do that, to make our education accessible to more and more young people, not only from South Africa, but from the, the continent as a whole, we will have to employ 500 new academics just to keep at the staff-student ratio that we currently have. 500 new academics <coughs> between now and 2025. And what troubles me is where do I find them and how do I pay them, knowing that government funding for universities is declining. But that's where you have to pursue a journey despite the contradictions or the complexities that we face. I think it's the right thing for the university to do to expand, even in difficult economic times. Because the failure to expand uh, and make opportunities available for generations of young people will be failing to do what we fundamentally set up to do as a university, and that is to create opportunities for future generations. Thank you very much. We really do want to get to the tables to talk about what you've heard, but before that, are there, are there any questions for clarification or questions that you'd like to take advantage of this opportunity to ask Dr. Dover? So, I, I think one of the things I see as a challenge is in, in societies like South Africa and Africa, we have different challenges because of the how much we need to bring up less educated on a primary and secondary education level, etc., to, to get to that level. But as a leader, you have to divide your time between uh, making sure the excellence is happening and also raising everyone to a standard so that they are just as competitive. And it sounds like that's pretty much the challenge of what the university is facing now. How do you, obviously, the answer is you need to do both, and you need to do one that contributes to both, but how do you actually? prioritize that. We have a short time as individuals to make an impact in a certain area or region. And, yeah. So how, how do you, how do you, what, what do you use as criteria? To sort of well, the, 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 you put it very well. It's not just a South African challenge. It's a challenge for everybody. Yeah. Uh, it's not just an African challenge because it's not in the interest of, let's say, the U.S. to have a whole continent of young people <laughs> who, 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 you know, to continue with this kind of, uh, with the poverty levels, the con levels of conflict and so forth. So it's a global issue, but how do we bridge the two? If I knew a short answer to that, I would have written it down somewhere, so I don't. But it's thinking every day about trade -offs. 
Now you can't ever trade excellence because in, you will be not only failing yourself, but you will be failing future generations. It's a question of how do you produce excellence at the level at which it's currently judged. Uh, and in, in science there are benchmarks, usually peer evaluation, and a whole set of benchmarks that, that you, you have to, to meet in order to show that you're excellent. And you need to show that you're excellent because you want your voice to count. Uh, and unless you show that you're excellent, your voice will not count. It's a question of how do you commit to excellence and at the same time be fully engaged, as I've argued we should be, with, with the particular questions that confront us at the local and the national and regional level. Well, the first thing is that uh, you have to make the trade-offs and know what those are and be comfortable about it. So our trade-off as a university is no, we're not going to be in the top 200, but we will be in the rankings. And we, we have to find a space where we are deemed to be a serious player in the rankings. And that's in around 400 to 300 where we'd like to be. Anybody there, first of all, only 2,000 universities across the world get considered for ranking. So you want to be one of those to be considered. Then you want to get into the top 500. But that's the trade-off. If you're in the 300s, you're a serious player uh, as an institution, particularly as an institution given the, the, the constraints we have. But I know what those trade-offs are. Is it morally correct for who we are and where we are? I think it's the moral. It's mor I'm morally comfortable with it. Uh, is it the same trade-off for every institution in the country? No. So I would say that the University of Cape Town and Sri Lanka needs to think through where their role is. The University of Ghana at Lagon needs to think through what their contribution is in relation to their sub-region and so forth. Um, so as a scientist as well, depending upon where you're working and where you find yourselves, but what I'm suggesting you do is to think about your, your responsibility of being engaged, socially and morally and ethically engaged and to think about the trade-offs you're making, uh, because we all do. I think that the, the problem comes in with when you don't think about it, because that's when we have generations of scientists and leaders saying, yes, this happened in my time, but I didn't know it was happening. Um, and we've heard that too often in the history of humanity that my job was simply to produce the technology. I had no responsibility in terms of how it was used. No. And I don't think we should have generations of science, science leadership who go back into that mode. Um, now, scientists have had visions of the world. If you go back to the 1930s and early 40s, the top people came out of that period, no matter what the discipline is, they had a vision of the future. The top physicists had a vision of, of, of the future. Uh, the top social scientists had a vision of the future. So in my discipline, I'm a social psychologist. A whole generation of the 1940s came out of Europe, uh, having seen what happened, the atrocities. Uh, so there's a generation that came out and said, we need to understand how, do, how does humanity systematically uh, kill people basis, based on group identity. So they were under, trying to understand what are the minimum conditions for inflicting torture, for inflicting discrimination, for inflicting violence. But they, they were driven by a vision of a future where that would never happen again. So what is your vision of the future? And if you're clear about your vision of the future, then I think that helps you understand the decisions you're making. Mm. And what I, I'm suggesting is that you should not conduct your science without understanding what your vision of the future is. And that has to be an inv a vision based on your engagement with your society. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right. Now, if you would, hold on to that. Turn to your, your colleagues at your table and begin to have a discussion about how does that relate to you? 
And what does that mean for you? And how might that relate to what we want to do moving forward? And once again, these conversations, we're talking, we're chatting normally, but at the same time, we're listening for those how to, how might we, in what ways might we statements so that we don't lose any of the questions that are emerging from our discussions. So you can kind of take the responsibility of noting those down for each other. One thought per post-it. See if you can start with that stem, how might we, in what ways might we. Let's talk at the tables for about 10 minutes. A little bit more, a little bit less, we'll see, we'll check in with you. And just see if you could come up with some more questions related to what you heard and what your reaction is to some things. 